Thank you so much for your talk. I think uh, my guess is that the overwhelming majority of people in this room do want to do different things at different times in different ways. That said, the reality in the world is that sometimes they're doing something requires uh, mastery of specialized knowledge. You, 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 you competed and made a lot of money in poker. Um, you probably would not want to sit down with your life savings to play gin rummy or bridge or canasta the very first day. And um, in the corporate world, it's the same thing. Uh, doctors have specialties. In corporations, there's some specialties. And, and at what point, I mean, we could all learn new tasks. How does one draw lines between tasks that an intelligent person with diligence could master and do well, and other things that are just so specialized that maybe you can't just take, let people switch willy-nilly. They'll never master the skills to do the job well. Yeah, great question. Um, and that's a question we think a lot about at, at Zappos. We've actually started to build up an infrastructure of something we've called badges. Um, and badges is really just a way to track and monitor what skill sets people have. Um, and what we try to do is match those up against roles. So the roles that are out there in the marketplace have badges associated with them. Um, and you can try to pick up new badges, new skill sets through whether it's classes, education, uh, doing, uh, doing the activity. So say you want to pick up software development. It's not like you're going to be able to step in on the first day and be like an expert software developer. But maybe there's a role that you can take on that is helping with some small bugs or something like that. And you can be mentored and tutored. Um, and you can help to increase your level in whatever that skill set is that you want to do. Um, and so really what we're trying to create is an internal marketplace for what work needs to happen what skills are necessary for that to happen, and then allow people to chart their own course through, uh, through the work. So um, charting their own course through how they want to grow and develop um, and what work uh, really makes sense for that growth and development. Um, so that's something I would say, I would say kind of on my personal life, you know, yeah, you're never gonna start as an expert, but you gotta start somewhere. Um, so a couple of years ago, I, I I took up real estate and I got my real estate license. Um, uh, and that's something I'd never done before, but I knew it kind of aligned with something I wanted to try. Uh, and just, you gotta start somewhere. So pick up something new and give it a try. Maybe you really like it, maybe it's not for you. Hi, thanks for sharing. So sometimes when we work in a big corporate office, for example, you are a really risky person, you wanna do something based on your in instinct, but you cannot do it because it's a big corporate office. So do you think for sometimes, if you have that type of personality, the best thing for you is to find a company who has adventurous spirit. Like, how do you initially to do that from your role right now in your current job to make a difference for your company? Yeah, um, I, I do think it's a good idea to align yourself with a company that has that has that in its DNA. Um, but I would say even if you're at a company that's very traditional, there are things that you can do to help with that. I mean. Even if you're in that traditional job hierarchy, you can think, okay, this is what I'm doing now. How can I take this to the next level? How can I stretch this? Um, so say it's uh, customer service. How can I take my normal job, what I normally do, and try to apply new things to it, come up with new ideas? Um, so that even if you're kind of constrained into one specific place in a hierarchy, um, how, can you, how can you look for that next new thing? Um, I think in general, that's much appreciated. Um, and, and obviously, you know, you have to wade kind of the political climate within your, your office. Maybe there's no, there's no ability to do that. But if you come up with an idea, you pitch it, I think more oftentimes than not, you're gonna be given some flexibility to try those ideas. Um, so I would say yes, align yourself with companies that have that, but even if you're not, do what you can in that, in that environment. So cities fail all the time, and one way they fail is in inequality of income, opportunity, health, whatever. Do you see challenges like that in a large company, and what would you do, what responsibility actually does the company have to make sure that doesn't occur? And Question number two, does the company have a responsibility to the city it's in? Hmm. Good question. Um, you know, I, I think 
uh, I'll, I'll get to your question. I, I think another thing that will, that oftentimes when cities go through tough times or, or uh, go, go down, um, a, another reason why that is is diversification, where they're, they're so in one industry and then if that one industry starts to flounder, it makes it really hard. I think we saw this in Detroit um, with the auto industry recently. Um, luckily, they've started to bounce back a little bit, but um, but I think that's one thing that will will lead to that as well. Um, as far as kind of the the income inequality or inequalities within company, I, I don't know that I have a great answer, but I will say that one of the things that Holacracy does as a system is allow it, it's it's a distributed authority system whereby in traditional companies, at the end of the day, any decision can be made at the top and pushed down um, throughout the company. One of the things that Holacracy is trying to do is distribute authority to the people who are on, the, on have the best knowledge to make that decision. So it believes that every person is a sensor for, for change. Um, and so, uh, so I think in that way, it empowers people to be able to act and, and make changes regardless of if you're the most senior person that's been here for 20 years or you're somebody who it's your first week in the office, you can be a sensor and, and make changes. Um, to your second question about does, do, do companies have a, have a obligation to be a good citizen of, of a city? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I think each company has to decide what its own morals are. I, I think there are a lot of benefits to being a good, a good partner with the city in that um, not only does it help the city normally, but it would help you as well uh, as a company. Um, you know, Zappos has been trying to do a lot in downtown Las Vegas to revitalize, uh, revitalize the city. Um, and so that's in our DNA. Um, but I would say, you know, it's got to be up to each, each, each company to decide that for themselves. But those decisions make up your, make up your culture, your DNA. And if you're the type of company that's doing those things, I think you'll be able to attract uh, attract better people and, and become a, a healthier company as well. So, when um, when like so many people are doing so many different creative things that they're trying to inject into a company, obviously have a lot of new ideas, and this is what you're going for. Um, how do you prioritize? Like, I'd imagine you have some kind of system for taking incoming requests and then you know processing them, but it's such an overwhelming amount of them, and how do you give people the right space to develop them adequately so that they can properly bring them in to be prioritized? Mm -hmm. And then also, there must be so much boring stuff that still has to happen. Um, you know, people like need to, obviously customer service is a huge part of Zappos, you need a whole army of people doing that and doing it diligently. How do you strike the balance between getting them to pay attention to things that are not so sexy while still exploring? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, and that's a great point, and this is part of our learning journey along the way is knowing that we need some of these systems and having to develop these systems um, to, to really be able to run in a self-organized fashion while being able to get the, get the business done. So the solution that we've come up with is something called people points. Um, and essentially what it is, every role, so I showed some of the roles in the organization, every role has a amount of budgeted people points. And essentially every person has 100% of their time that they could be giving to some effort, people points becomes the budget for which uh, how we say this this effort has 50 people points, which means we need you know about a half time person to work on this effort. Um, so really, what it's doing is setting up a marketplace whereby yeah you can't just go out and do anything, and there are um, there are jobs that may not be sexy um, that need to get done, um, and we have a budget for that work to be done. Um, so it allows us to drive alignment while also allowing for new innovative things to pop up to fund those, just like as happens in a city, um, to fund those uh, to get those off the ground. Um, we're also looking at, uh, within the context of that system, uh, other ways to fund work. So we're, we have kind of internal crowdsourcing, uh, crowdsourcing where people can can crowdsource an idea and 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 fund something new. So that's kind of the system that we have, but it's it's more or less a marketplace for work that needs to get done. Um, just wondering, um, what was it fruitful um, as far as changing the um, you know the way that your company works and is built? It was what was the outcome of that? 
Um, so we're still in the in the early stages uh, of it. Um, I think the really in it's a big change, and so it takes time to kind of take hold and for us to really be able to leverage it. Um, we've been at it for a little over two years. I think one of our big wins is that we've been able to continue to operate our business, been able to continue to thrive and grow um, as we've done this transition. Um, and I think all, another win is that there have been some new initiatives that have gotten off the ground um, that, that people are kind of exploring and, and working on different things where in the old system they would have been pigeonholed into one specific area. Um, and people, I, you know, I think have really enjoyed that. Um, so I, I would say while we aren't kind of fully, you know, with our legs under us running as fast as we can right now, we're still kind of growing and learning into it. Um, it hasn't gotten in the way of the, the business operating and um, we've really started to see the, the vision of what it could do. What's been the biggest challenge, John? Um, I think that we're 1,500 people and every single person is kind of on their own individual learning journey. And so it's not like we introduced this and it was like, okay, now everybody gets it, let's go. It's like we introduced this, we had to build up our throughput to be able to take on new teams, to educate new teams, to get them going. Some teams started uh, two and a half years ago. Some people started, the rollout took about a year. And so some people had already been doing it for a year when other people were just starting. And so there was kind of a disparity of how much knowledge people had um, and a disparity of how fast this kind of took with people. And so, um, so everybody's kind of on that, their own individual journey. And it's taken, a, one of our biggest challenges is it takes a lot of patience with our fellow employees to be able to say, you know, to not freak out if like they're doing something that you don't think is in line with our new philosophy, um, to not freak out and to have patience with them and say like, I understand we're still, we're still growing into this. It sounds like you have to hire different people now. Um, no, I, I don't think so. So our core values have not changed at all. Who we are as a company is still exactly the same. Um, how I like to think about it is this change has allowed us to deepen our commitment to our core values in certain ways. Um, and so uh, I don't think we hire any differently than we hire before. Um, we've always wanted to hire entrepreneurs and that's still the case today. Um, so a few companies like Kickstarter, Patagonia, um, This American Life have become public benefit corporations. Um, so that means that they have equal responsibility to society at large as well as their own shareholders. How do you balance um, the sort of vision and the core values that you mentioned of Zappos, um, you know, when you have to ultimately answer to shareholders? Uh, sometimes the vision and the responsibility to sort of society, the city that you're in, uh, and, and your employees changes when you have to answer to shareholders. So how do you sort of balance that? Yeah, I mean, so we were, Zappos was acquired by Amazon in 2009. Um, and so we're a, a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Amazon. Um, and so, but one of the kind of preconditions of that sale was that we would be able to operate independently even, um, even as Amazon had acquired us. And they've been really true to that, to that sentiment, to that statement. Um, as we've as we've progressed, we've been with them for over six years now, um, and they've been really true to that. And that's allowed us to chart our own vision, to set our own vision, um, whether that's uh, with how we want to, uh, you know, treat our employees, or whether that's how we operate as a company, or what we're what we're doing, you know, where what work we're doing. Um, and so I think that's really the the biggest thing is having that independence. Um, but ultimately, yes, I mean, companies uh, companies have shareholders and have a responsibility to shareholders. Um, and so, but I don't think those are two disjointed things. Um, and you you listed some great companies that that understand that those aren't two disjointed things. 